I thought we'd start, I mean, we're here to talk about a uh, hundred reasons for war, but I thought we might start with your journey as a writer. Can I, can we go back to Hobart? Sure. Back to, yeah. When, when did it start for you, the idea that you might want to write for the theatre? Well, I mean, it's a good place to start for 100 Reasons for War, too, because it's the start of my relationship with Robert Jarman, the director of that show. Um, I did a lot of theatre at school in Hobart, had a crazy drama teacher um, from America called Bill Jarmstone. <laughs> and so in grades 9 and 10 and things, we were doing Feldenkrais oh, wow. and reading Sam Shepard plays um, and Brecht and all that kind of stuff. Mm. Uh, and that was amazing. I mean, I think if you were into drama, he was the best teacher to have. And if you weren't really into drama, he was the worst teacher to have because he's never going to win you over to it um, in his baggy pants. Uh, and I, I absolutely loved it. Um, I found, I got introduced to Shepard and he seemed like, like this rock star of a playwright. Um, the whole approach, I mean, probably even just hearing about drama through a New York accent made it all seem mm. really cool. Actor studio kind of. Yeah, Marlon yeah, moment. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, and so I was trying to be an actor and then realised I was really shit at acting. Right. Excuse my language. <laughs> um, so I stopped that. Um, and at about the same time that I was finishing school, the one professional theatre company in Hobart, Z Tango, had gone bust, which mm. was really, really terrible. Mm. Um, and kind of the the industry down there suffered for 10 years or so off the back of that but what it meant was that there were empty theatres mm. and so it was kind of easy to hire a theatre out so there, were, so people would just put on a show um, a friend wanted to put something on and I said well I'll try writing something because I always enjoyed writing mm. and it just kind of snowballed from there mm. um, I had something on um, at the, a theatre there called The Backspace, uh, just a small 20 minute play which was written in American accents, that's how obsessed by Sam Shepard I was. Um, and uh, Robert Jarman saw it, who is, was this kind of a big guy in Tassie, has always been a big guy in Tassie, and he said, Oh, Tom, you must write something for me one day, um, which told, like, just sent me wild. Um, and off the back of that, I got a grant, Annette Downs, another Tasmanian legend, approached me about an emerging artist grant which led me to be mentored by Timothy Daly, which just opened up the mainland mm. to me. And a few artists that have come through from Tasmania under that. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hamish Michael, Michael yeah, was yeah. another one at that time, mm. yeah. Mm. I mean, it was a totally fantastic program because it was about, it wasn't about a specific, it was kind of mentoring, mm. so it was about long-term development, mm. which was what was so fantastic about it. So you then, so you went to Sydney. And went to Sydney. Did you study? You studied. Um, yeah, I, I, the first thing that pushed me to Sydney was kind of having a close relationship with Timothy. Mm. Um, but I also applied for the Night of Playwriting course, then run by Ken Healy. Um, My dad. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then I got to go to something called Interplay, mm. which was, I mean, it's a real tragedy that Interplay is not here anymore. Yeah, it's awful. Yeah, it was a, it's the International Young Playwrights Festival. Play, um, playwrights from, when I was there, I think 40 playwrights from around the world mm. came. Mm. And it's not just that it was playwrights from around the world, but it was playwrights from the royal court mm. or from big companies in Germany and um, mentors from those companies mm. too. Mm. And it was there in Townsville, of mm. all places, mm. Uh, that I got to meet um, Simon Stevens, mm. who was then playwright in residence at the Royal Court. Mm. And he said to a bunch of us, if we could get to London, he'd um, find a place for us in, the, in his classes. The classes are open to anyone, but he'd kind of let us jump the queue a little bit because mm. of how far we're travelling, which was totally wonderful. And that shift that I've had from going from Hobart to Sydney and how that had expanded my mind happened again, even more so with going to study under Simon. So then, between the, that visit to the Royal Court and now, you've been bouncing back and forth between here and Europe yeah. um, quite a lot. Um, working over there, working over here. How is that First of all, how is that as a, as a life? Sounds, it sounds marvellous. Oh, but also, yeah. in terms of your own writing, yeah. to the stuff that you write, where, how does that impact? It exposes you to what is happening creatively um, through seeing the plays that are going on at the Court or the Young Vic or the National or Almeida or all those theatres, Traverse up in Edinburgh, um, uh, Europe too. It exposes you to all that other writing 
and therefore what theatre can do. Um, and that's, that's incredibly important because every time we write, we need to be thinking, what can, how can theatre work for me? How can, why is theatre the right way to tell this story? Yeah. And therefore, what can theatre achieve? Yeah. Um, and we should examine that anew each time, I think, too. We shouldn't rest on our laurels about understanding theatre. We should always be trying to find out what, what is new, what can theatre do in a new way. Okay, so now, when you got the commission, for 100 Reasons for War. What was the conversation with Robert Jarman, or who, yeah. who was the direct commissioner in Blue yeah. Cow, yeah. there's a company? Yeah. What, what were the conversations? Because yeah. my understanding of it is that it is in some way part of the Gallipoli centenary, oh, part of a wave yeah, yeah. of commissions around the country to do yeah. that, and it is certainly the boldest of any of <laughs> those projects that I've come across. Yeah. So I'm really interested to know what it was that Robert said to you. Yeah. And Well, that is all down to Robert, really. Uh, it was probably two or three years ago that he first talked to me about it and he said, just like you brought up, that with the centenary of Gallipoli is going to, um, this event is going to bring about a whole range of new works about Gallipoli and he said, and there, there's going to be a lot of khaki in them and um, if, if kind of history is anything to go by, there, there's going to be a lot of glorification of what happened at Gallipoli or reinforcement of Gallipoli's place in the Australian narrative. Mm. And he didn't want that. He wanted something that was going to be um, quite different to that because he felt like it was important that we, um, that we have a kind of more rounded debate about the place of war in Australian history and contemporary Australia as well. There was the um, sadly late governor of Tasmania gave an amazing speech at a anniversary of Gallipoli a few years ago where he brought a lot of this up. He said, you know, we need to see, remember that Gallipoli was a failure and a terrible thing where kind of people died and died because they were following orders that perhaps should never have been given. And he got in a lot of trouble for saying that. Um, but this is the world uh, Robert wanted to explore. His pitch to me was um, the First World War was called the Great War because it was meant to bring about the Great Peace mm. and what happened there. And the other thing he said was he wanted something for the main stage of the Theatre Royal, which, I mean, you can see I'm uh, getting a bit kind of welled up from that because that's the theatre I grew up going to see things in, so that was very exciting. Um, and it's a beautiful theatre. And it's a beautiful theatre, Australia's nice. oldest theatre, ornate, beautiful, saved by Laurence Olivier from becoming a car park. Mm. Um, and he also wanted something that a Tasmanian audience wouldn't normally get to see in terms of form. So he was basically telling me to write about 100 years of war and to do it in a way that would shock, uh, potentially shock an audience in terms of the structure of the work. I mean, what an incredibly exciting um, commission and very daunting. Mm, sure, sure. And for a year or so I couldn't, you know, as I started researching it, I just couldn't write anything because it was too big. It was everything that I read felt like it needed to be the story. Mm. But then when I started to write that, I'd think, oh no, but there's that yeah. thing that needs to be in this world too. And so it was hard. It took a long time to find anything to, mm. any way to put it on the page. Mm. We can't, we don't have time to go into all the, ver the various strands of it because yeah. they are deeply complex. But, um, what I did want to talk to you about is that it, it is, it's, it's, a, it's written in a form that has got various different labels attached. Some would describe it as post-traumatic, some would call it open text. Um, but essentially it's, uh, as a shorthand, let's say that all the text is unassigned. That yeah. is, there is no uh, indication of how many actors mm. should, might or could perform yeah. it, and no sense of gender of those yeah. actors or what their relationships are. In other words, all of that is open yeah. to the company who, who elect to perform the, the piece. Um, this is like, a, can, I suppose, something that's, I mean, it, it, it's actually technically nearly 100 years old, that, but, it's, but it's, mm. it's much more common in the last 10 or yeah. 15 years. As a writer, what excites you about those ideas? What excites you about, because, I mean, we think normally of a writer 
kind of who was there to tell a story and that the you know in, in, in the kind of more I guess in the more classical dramatic sense yeah we get the script we know what to do we fill it we flesh it you know we bring our own spark and flavor but yeah this is a whole nother idea where where where, where the story is not controlled by the playwright yeah um so on the front page of this play I've written something like setting God knows yes. characters <laughs> no don't ask me. Yeah, yeah, don't something ask me. Like that. <laughs> um, uh, so, God, where do I start with this? Um, the, for me as a playwright, um, I think I have two tools to work with. Mm. I have the words on the page and I have how the words look on the page. Mm. And that's all I've got to communicate the world mm. that I'm kind of suggesting. Um, to the other artists involved. And that's the other aspect of it. What I love about theatre is that it's a collaboration. Mm. Um, my role is as important as the directors and the designers and the performers and everyone else involved in the production. And that's what makes theatre so wonderful. Um, it's, I mean, it's, it's a team effort. Mm. Uh, and I, I, I love that really deeply. So whenever I write anything, even kind of the straighter works, I always feel like stage directions, for instance, should only be there if they're as important as a word, as a yeah. line. Yeah. Um, if, if it's a character communicating something in some way. Mm. Uh, so I want to leave my worlds as open as I can so that the designer and director and actors can really kind of take it on and make it whatever they want. Mm. When I was studying under um, Simon at the court, he told us you know, he reinforced with us again and again that there's really only one story that's ever been told. A character exists in an environment, they want something, something or someone gets in their way, and they either get it or they don't, but they learn something along the way. And this is every story that's ever been written. And that alone fascinates me, that as a species, there is this one structure that we go back to again and again and again, year after year after year. I find that deeply fascinating. Because there is this kind of innate story in us that we need to keep revisiting. I'm interested in finding new ways to explore that story mm. um, and what that story gives us in terms of an emotional journey, a beginning, middle and end. Uh, and that's something that sometimes I feel is, um, I struggle to find, which could be my failings in those works, is a sense of beginning, middle and end. And that, and that doesn't need to be a straight narrative, yeah. Um, but there needs to be a journey. I need to feel different at the end to how I felt at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, that's really important to me. In theatre generally, I think design should do that. I think direction, performance, everything should should be working towards making an audience feel different at the it, end. Uh, yeah, it is one of the most magical sensations, oh, isn't it? Where you yeah. kind of go, I'm in the same seat and yet I am in yeah. a completely different world. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. An, an amazing absolutely. sensation. Yeah. Um, and so with this kind of work, uh, I. I want to find a way to take what I loved about those works, like blowing my mind about theatre and about words and about kind of language and experience and, and also putting an audience in a position to begin with where, oh, something's different here. Uh, which maybe, if you can do it in the right way, opens them up to new sensations, to be open to new sensations and new experiences. Humour's really important, I think, in terms of that. Mm. Disarm an audience. I mean, in the other work that I do about, like, Beyond the Neck or in No More Shall We Part, use humour a lot to disarm people because then they're more willing to cry later on. Yes, yes, yes. Um, but in this kind of stuff, it's people will feel, an audience will feel more comfortable going on a journey that feels unfamiliar if they're getting to laugh along the way because mm. laughter endears us mm. to others that we're with. So that's a really important element of it. Um, uh, in terms of this particular work, the scope was so big and the themes were so big that I felt like I needed to create a form on the page that allowed for that mm. epic scale. Mm. Um, and so mm. this sense of um, you can do it with any number of characters mm. and it covers everything from um, the, the violence of chimps and the love of bonobos to um, uh, domestic violence in Australia today mm. to the black wars in Tasmania mm. in the 19th century. So it, to the beginning of the universe, mm. you know, mm. it's kind of covering everything from um, singularity right through to today. Mm. And so it needed to be a big 
they needed to allow that and be open to that. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, it's very it reminds me very much of the kind of German writing in the '60s and all that. You know, yeah, right. It's something. It's very poetic what you do, uh, mm. and 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 the theatre is a, is a for, it, you know is is three D poetry. I think that's. Yeah, I, I have such an interesting relationship with poetry in that I am, um, I, I kind of I, I, I openly talk of it with um, distaste mm-hmm. and like, oh, stupid poets. <laughs> um, but I think that's because I'm also quite jealous yeah. of what they can achieve. You know, when you read, I mean, the the one poem that I can really um, uh, kind of quote it's a, and is there a language issue on these no, no, no okay no. is um they suck you up your mum and dad they may not mean to but they do which is the opening stanza of a poem by god now i can't even yeah who is it I, i've known this uh, uh, anyway yeah. that guy yeah that guy um, yeah uh, and like what a beautiful like in very simple language mm. um and using humor he sums up everything mm. about uh about kind of one what one generation passes on to the other and therefore what is the human experience mm. um and you know i guess i'm jealous that it might take me a hundred pages to communicate something like that well it's interesting i mean you may you may at some point later on look back at some of this writing that you're doing now because i see it very much as as poetry so yeah you know, right, it's, right it is very condensed and very spare well, i'm very interested in the musicality of normal everyday language mm. uh, i find the way people speak really incredible. I'm also interested in the way theatre can use language to affect us like music affects us, which yeah. is at a non-intellectual level, yeah, yeah. something about rhythm and timbre and pitch that can yeah. can move us. Yeah. I'm interested in that, yeah. I, I think I think 100 Reasons for War achieves a lot that I really hope for, but also fails a lot. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and I think, I think, I, I, I kind of feel like, what, what do I want to say about that? Um, uh, the provocation was so big from Robert, and, and failure has to be part of that, I think. If you're going to attempt to write something like that, you need to be open to the sense that you're going to fail yeah. at some elements of it. I'm not entirely sure if everything in 100 Reasons for War is actually dramatic. I think Robert did an incredible job at making things, um, you know, actors and directors can really do a lot yeah. and I think they've made some bits work that might not necessarily work on the page but but I kind of feel okay about having that in the work because also you want to be able to do better next time <laughs> so I guess I just want to say failure is okay <laughs> yeah. Yeah.